All right, welcome back, everybody. Back in the library, it's Jim and Lucas. Different, much different format this week. First time we're doing this format, we're going to go through a book and dissect it a bit and talk about how we apply it with our athletes. With it being athlete builder, we talked about the six different things, three for your head and three for your body, head being your mindset, knowledge, and how you deal with teammates. And then with your body, there's your training, your your nutrition, and how you recover. Well, we're always trying to improve those areas, and we're going to go through a book on how we do that and how we apply it. So it's been really impactful. The name of the book is Atomic Habits, right here, by James Clear. It says on the front, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results, an easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones. James Clear. It's the book I've bought the most. I've given away dozens, probably 30, 40 books. Every year, our high school athletes that go on to college, I usually give a book, and for the last several years, it's been this one. There's always one or two in the gym library that's available for people to take. Um, so this is the one I bought the most and have given to the most people. My daughter, when she went to Alabama for her freshman year, it was the required reading for all incoming freshmen. I'm not sure how many books he sold, but it's well over a million. And uh, so it's been great. It's been great for me. It's been great for a lot of people in my family. It's great for how we deal with people at the gym, uh, training people, adults, kids. I can't for the life of me recall who suggested it. It could have been my wife. could have been Jesse Dale. I want to say Eric Farley, who's another uh, coach at the gym that also coaches a lot of baseball. I think it was Eric that brought this book to my attention, went through it, and it's it's fantastic. And like everything like you'll learn in the book, it's set up to read well, to listen well, and to work through a chapter at a time very easily. And one of the components is making your habits stick is make it easy. So everything about it has been great. We utilize it all the time. And the book is great. It starts off right in the first chapter, page one, surprising power of atomic habits. It starts off, it talks about the British cycling team in 2003 basically they had been crap for over 100 years and then dave brailsford comes on and turns the whole thing around in about 100 years time they've won one gold medal and zero tour de france's 110 years with no uh, tour de france's the performance of the british riders had been so underwhelming it says europe manufacturers in europe refused to sell them their bikes and they didn't want to. They don't want to be associated with the team. They didn't want to sell their own bikes to the team because they didn't want to be associated with that losing brand. Well, Brailsford comes on and says, with his relentless commitment to a strategy that I referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains, they're searching for tiny margin of improvement in everything they do. He said, which is the definition of kaizen, one of our core values, one percent better in everything they do. Some examples. They went so far as to re- redesign the bike seats so they're more comfortable. They rubbed alcohol on the tires for better grip. They asked riders to wear electrically heated overshorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature. They used biofeedback sensors to see how the athletes responded to training. Different fabrics to wear in wind tunnels, different fabrics to wear when they're in r- indoor racing suits. Everything to be more and more aerodynamic. They tested the different types of massage oils to see if that they would recover better. They had the surgeon come in, show them how to wash their hands so they're less likely to get sick. They went over and decided which pillows and mattresses were optimized for the best night's sleep for recovery. They painted the inside of the team's truck so that in case there was any dust or dirt inside the truck, they didn't want that getting in the bike or in the chain to slow it down. In five years' time, the British cycling team dominated. They won the events at the 08 Olympic Games. They won 60% of all the gold medals available. Four years later in London, they brought home, they raised the bar. They won nine gold, they say nine gold records and seven world records. The same year, Wiggins on the team, he won the Tour de France. The next year, his teammate Froome won it, and he won it again in 15, 16, and 17. In a 10 year time frame, the cyclists won 178 world championships. 66 Olympic or Paralympic gold medals and captured five tours to France, all from doing small little things. So that's the point. And that's the point of training. That's the point of incrementally getting better. 
the compound interest effect in all six areas, your nutrition, physical training, your mindset training, all of it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through these chapters. It's going to be a bit of an educational tutorial, a workshop, and I'm going to apply it in two different ways. I'm going to take one from the head, so we're going to talk about how we would apply this to improving some actual tactics and things to do with your mindset. And then I'm on the physical side, we're going to talk about nutrition, talk about how to tactically improve there. And then I'm going to ask Lucas specifically how would how they move the needle systematically in small little ways at his gym over at Northside. All right. It's a four-step model they talk about. There's the Q, which you wanted to make things obvious to change your habit. You want to set up a, an attractive craving so that you're willing to do it. Then you want to make the actual response, make it easy. And then whatever you do, you want to have some kind of feedback that's satisfying so you do it again. So it's a four-step mode. Uh, cue, craving, response, and then a reward. Goals set the direction. Systems make it happen. This reminds me, I'm going through the airport one time, and I pull up the Titans of Tools by Tim Ferriss. And he talks about, I just flipped to one of the pages, and the whole Titan of Tools book is about different guys that he interviewed or guys and ladies, how to get better. And the one page I pulled to, one of the guy's quotes, and I can't remember who it was, but Tim had it in there, and he said, goals are for losers and systems are for winners. And I thought that about that for a minute because I'm like, well, I have goals. That's, that kind of sucks. That's crap. I got goals. I, I want to yeah. meet, meet my goals. And here's the thing. The goals are designed, and it talks about here in Chapter 1, how they are directional. They keep you on a path. The problem with that is that, well, one, it's, it's excellent to use, right? You want to have some direction. But if you're not happy until you reach the goal, then you're kind of miserable the whole along the way. Yeah. Once you attain the goal, you're happy. And then probably 24, 36 hours later, you're back to being non-happy again because oh, yeah. you're not striving for anything. Yeah, yeah. So for me, and what I've tried to work with people, the goal becomes the process. The goal becomes the journey all along. The goal becomes... How can I win today, hit little things today so I'm happy today? How can I win tomorrow so I'm happy tomorrow? That becomes a lot more sustainable process. And then once I hit a big target, say a kid gets to college and they, he gets a scholarship or win, wins a title, huge, right? I love right. that. Yeah. But I'm not just miserable the next day. I'm like, all right, well, how am I winning today? So yeah. chapter one, we talk about that. And then talks about the compound interest effect. And this and it simply just lays out the framework, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and then make it satisfying. Going right into chapter two, talks about your habits and your identity. So before it even gets to those four step process, it stops for a minute and talks about your habits and your identity. And what I say to people is, you are what you do. You are what you you become. What your habits are. So at the core, in a nice small tiny circle and a little ball is your identity and around that are your habits and around that is are, are the outcomes if you start with what you want to out what your outcome target is a lot of people will say that's a goal change that to being who do you want to be what do you want to be not do i want to win this what do i want to be so if i can figure out what i want to be it enables you to eventually win it right so if i want to be x that will then guide your process. Once you have your process, you do it enough times, that starts shaping your identity because you start feeling it, living it. It becomes who you are. It becomes your core. Once you have that core set, then your identity drives you. It drives you to improve your process even more, which then takes or improves your habits and your process even more, which then takes you out to your overall goals or the outcomes that you're looking for. All right. So, from a mindset standpoint, I want to be more of an executor. I want to think like as a business owner, as a coach, I want to execute. I want to win. I want to push things. I want to get things done. I don't want to procrastinate. I don't want to delay things. I want to move forward. So with that being the idea that we're going to use in this example about being a better executor, and then from a nutrition standpoint, if I'm dealing with an athlete or with myself, if I want to be leaner and gain more muscle. I'm going to talk about nutrition in that piece. What I want to do is I want to focus on these outcomes and then the habits and change my identity, use my identity to change the habits, which then 
shapes the outcome. And it goes right into chapter three, which is the four steps. Make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. So the four laws, law one, make it obvious. How do I do that in these two things? So unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Well, people will say, this is just the way I am. This is who I am. Yes, you're right. This is who you are. But do not think that you are a slave and you cannot change your identity or who you are. You are not just what you were born. You can create and change and alter your subconscious, which will then direct your action and move you forward to win towards whatever your endeavor is. So I need an awareness, what I wrote down, of what I'm doing in order to change. So to make it obvious, if I want to be known as myself as a better executor and get things done from a mindset standpoint, what would I actually do? What steps can I actually take? And I like things right in the morning, and I end up just using the bathroom and the sink and uh, my toothbrush as my indicator. So when I get up, I take care of things. Right when I get up, I make my bed, uh, go to the bathroom, and drink a glass of water. I want to make sure things are ready. So for me to be a better executor, I decided that I need to meditate for two minutes a day and eventually five, but two minutes a day just to clear my mind. So I'm working on my mindset. I want to clear my mind for two minutes. And then for the next minute after that, I want to think about the tasks, about just executing, just getting things done, getting things done. So to make it obvious, I have a note on the bathroom mirror. It says executor. And then right next to that on the on the counter is my journal and a pen. And it says meditate two minutes. So what I then do is I set up my room so that everything's dark, taking care of everything. Everything's cleaned up. There's no clutter. I sit down. I'm on the floor, back straight, and I'm breathing in through my nose. Four seconds. I hold it for four. Exhale for four seconds. Hold it for four. Doing some basic box breathing. I do it for two minutes. Any thought comes in, I envision it coming in, and I just blow it out. Two minutes of that, constantly clearing my head, clearing my head, and then one minute of just thinking about, you're the person that gets shit done. We're getting shit done, we're winning. We're getting the big task done, we're not delaying. Crossing things off. I love just crossing things off. And it's all set up, and it's it's obvious, I see it first thing in the morning. Here's my note, here's my notebook, here's my pen. From a physiologically standpoint, a nutrition piece, I want to make it obvious. The first thing I would do is I would open my phone, and the first thing I would see would be programmed to go right to a food log. So when I turn my alarm off, I see my food log, so I know that when I'm done meditating, what I'm about to eat, it's obvious. I need to log what goes in my mouth. The first thing you want to do if you want to improve your nutrition, you have to figure out what's going in, right? So if I want to make my habit obvious. I'm just going to start logging all my food. Those are my two examples I'm going with. I'm going to keep developing those throughout this whole podcast today. Lucas, from your standpoint at the gym, what's one or two things you have set up that makes it obvious so you guys can train a little bit better? For me, and the way we operate at our gym, um, you know, where I'm at, we have a lot of, uh, we deal with a lot of kids, obviously. So one of the things we do to make sure we operate at a high level, one, we have our phone bucket where kids will come in and they'll drop off their phone because if a kid has their phone, they're not going to be as focused or as, they're not going to be working as hard because mm-hmm. they're going to have a distraction. So part of what we do is try to eliminate distractions. One, it's a school rule. You're not allowed to have your phone, Mm -hmm. but two, this allows us to guarantee that you're going to have a place to put it. You know, it's safe and it just completely eliminates the distraction. Cool. Um, The other one is we, we make sure the room is in a, in a place of good operation. So we make sure if we have bench press set up, the benches are set up and ready to go. Our back squats are set up, ready to go. So we make things a little bit more convenient so we can focus on the, our tasks that we have to do. 
Got if that it. makes sense. If, if that makes sure. sense. So that leads us right into into environment. So with law one of making it obvious, it says best way to start a new habit on chapter five, implementation intention. I will insert behavior at such time in location. I will meditate for two minutes in my bedroom first thing in the morning. I will log my food right after I eat, after every meal. And it talks about habit stacking. I take a habit I already have, which is get up, go to the bathroom, make my bed, clean up my room, take, brush my teeth, drink a glass of water. Habits that are already ingrained, I don't think about. There's no brain power. There's no work. There's no straining involved to try this habit. They're ones I already have. I take that one, those four or five, and I stack the new one I want to have right next to it so I'm more likely to do it. And it just kind of feeds off the coattails. Like when Cheers was on TV, the next best show, ratings-wise, was the show after Cheers because Cheers did so well. The habit is you're going to sit there and watch be on the same NBC station. So the next show crushed it because you're already sitting there watching it. Just stay there, right? So I just stack it right that. So in chapter six, it talks about environment. I wrote environment is is king. Set yourself up for success with your locale, your equipment, people, tasks, and what you see. If you change your environment, you change the cue and you change the habit. So I added a notebook in my environment for the meditating, had my phone there. I changed my environment for that. If needed, start with a totally new environment. That's why when people like bottom out from an addiction, they go somewhere else to get completely cleaned up. They change all their friends. Yeah. When I was in the financial world, we're whining and dining clients all the time, lunches and dinners. You're out forever, big heavy meals, plenty of drinks, tons of calories. So we would go out, sales calls, and we're all drinking afterwards. Well, in 2012, when I start Stopped doing that so much and started concentrating more on being healthy, doing P90X, running, CrossFit. Instead of going out drinking excessively or eating those big meals, I would have more lunch and breakfast appointments. And after work, I'd go work out. Well, the same guys at work were wanting to go out drinking. I'm now going to a gym, a whole different place. All my friends over here that were drinking were like, oh, come on, let's go. I completely changed my environment and who I'm with, where I'm at. It changes my habits. So if I want to go back to my example of mindset, I want to be an executor so I get tasks done. I'm going to start off with some basic meditating to think about doing it. I make sure my room is clean. There's there's distractions are gone. I might set up some music so it it keeps me calm. There's we have four dogs. None of them in the room. There's no people in the room. It's dark. I see my note. I set it up so I have some success. If I change my environment where I open up my app for the Nutrition, first thing in the morning, it's right there. So my environment is right there. And then when I come downstairs, there's a note on the fridge, track your food. I'm completely setting it up so I have a better shot. And it goes right into chapter seven, self-control. Don't, you don't try to increase your will or just be tougher and more focused and more disciplined and more determined. Just make it easier. You can't make it, really. Make, make it obvious. So you said you're not going to be able to just flip the switch and just be a a hardcore dude. This is a, a disciplined not, person. It doesn't work that way. So you just I make it easy, right? So what is what's uh, something that you would add to the your gym that makes it a little bit easier or make it a little, a little more obvious when you come in? One thing we have is here's your TVs. Here's where you log in. Here's the workout. You obviously you yeah. see it. We see it yeah. right when you walk in. Anything you guys do there? Um, so just to make things obvious for our kids when they come in, they know. So we have workout. We have everything on our whiteboard. We don't have a whole lot of technology, so everything's just kind of our workouts are on the whiteboard. The kids know exactly what they're going to do on a Monday. So when the kids come in, they know if it's a Monday, you know, because we do. We'll we'll stay on the same same workout, same whatever it is for four or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So they know exactly what they're looking at, what day it is. So if it's a Monday, they know we may be doing upper body. If it's low, you know, they're going to be on a Tuesday, it's going to be a lower body. So to make it easier for them, they know what to expect the day they come in. So they go look at the whiteboard. They know what workout we got. Um, You know, our warmups, they know how to do our warmups. 
it just kind of cool. limits their limits their um, limits their thinking, so they don't have to worry about thinking about what they got to do instead sure. of just executing what they have to do. And so it's just a basic write up on the whiteboard. Just keeping up the same day of the week. If you always know that Tuesday is a lower is a Tuesday lower body day. Yeah. If Tuesday lower body day, you might need a belt. And when yeah. Monday's an upper body day, you might need wrist wraps. Yeah. Hey, it's Monday. And it's, I need, I'm, I need, and it's the same all the time, year after year. It yeah. takes away, oh, man, I didn't know that Monday was upper body. I didn't bring my wrist wraps. Oh. All right. It's the same all the time. All four years, the same kids there. It's all, it's all, it's all systematized. Thinking has yeah. to go away. It makes it easier. It lubes the whole situation so there's no friction. Yeah. Yeah. And the we, second we'll, law, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. We'll, uh, I mean, sometimes we'll just to keep it hyper structured, we'll, we'll do the workouts quite literally on a whistle. I blow the whistle, you do the rep. So they, they don't have to think. They don't have a chance to, for their mind to wander off. Sure. You know, so it's a way of us just kind of controlling and structure, putting more structure so we can get more work done, essentially. Yep. Second law, make it attractive. So you make it obvious. You see the fishy sees a little lure, and you want to make the lure attractive so the fish goes and gets it, is my analogy, right? Right. Use super normal stimuli and exaggerated cues. The habits are dopamine feedback loop. When I can predict habits will be, will be rewarded, the dopamine gets released. You know, habit stack plus temptation building. After I brush my teeth, I will pick up my journal and start meditating. After I will do that, I will then think about the tasks I want, the tasks I want to execute that day. I do what I need, then I can do what I want. I will not do what I want, which is go eat breakfast until I make sure I get my meditation done and I get ready to log my food for what I'm, I'm about to eat. So I put the journal next to my toothbrush, and then the next nut nutrition piece for me is, all right, log the food. Right down the stairs after I finish eating, right next to it, you know, a lot of people have four canisters. One will be like, Coffee, sugar, those things, right? So yeah. ours are chocolate protein, vanilla protein, BCAAs, and the third canister, and then creatine. It's creatine, yeah. <laughs> it sits right there next to the coffee maker. It's right yeah. there next to the refrigerator. So if I know I'm taking 10, 10 milligrams or 10 grams of creatine that day, it's sitting right there. I grab, a, yeah. I grab orange juice or whatever. I mix it. Done. Next yeah. habit, knocked off the list. For the longest time, I would just forget about taking all my supplements. Mm -hmm. So the creatine, fish oil, vitamin D, all that jazz, probiotic. Yeah. What do I do? Stack that pill container like those 80-year-olds that have those seven oh, yeah. days a week things. Well, I got four of those for, for an entire month. I filled yeah. the entire month. Vitamin D is all right there. Probiotics all right there. I just keep stacking the next habit I need to do so I can keep improving the nutrition piece. Then I evolve. Those will get checked off the box or just done now. What would be my next target? So if I get the journal done and I think about executing, now it's kind of in my subconscious. I finish eating. Now I'm going to start looking at my first task. I'm already thinking, what's my priority? Do I already have it identified and written down? I'm, I want to be an executor, which means I got to knock the first priority off. Then I get my first win. So boom, I get up, morning routine. Finish eating, and I decide do I, sometimes I'll walk the dog or not. But otherwise, can I get the first task knocked off and crossed off? Win. I'm an executor. I already got. So really, I get my so nutrition. Kind of, I log my food, take my supplements. Boom, have breakfast. Second win. Makes so sense. So you kind of look at it as you know, not necessarily stacking habits, but stacking little wins throughout the day. Sure, which become little habits. The wins are the yeah. any type of yeah. action movement mm -hmm. that's a habit and that's why the phrase becomes win the day can I, how many wins can i stack during the day I'm, I'm if i'm getting two wins a day that's great if i'm getting 32 yeah. wins a day much better make sense oh yeah. yeah yeah so that's what we're trying to get the our athletes to do it's what we're trying our, our clients to do yeah it kind of makes me think back 
um, a lot of this kind of makes me from my own personal um, experience thinking back to the bodybuilding show and prepping for the show. It Getting up, making sure I had 20 ounces of water before breakfast was important. 20 ounces of water before I actually ate. So drink my, I would always keep a gallon of water right next to my bed. So the first thing I did before I did anything else was get up, put my feet on the ground and drink 20 ounces of water right there. Boom, my water's done. Next thing I got to do, start working on my meal. When I started getting busy in the cardio, it was drink my 20 ounces of water, get my coat on, get my pants on, walk down to the treadmill and get my hour worth of cardio in. Boom. After that, so I got I to do it fasted. So when I'm done doing my cardio, go back up, start making my breakfast every single day. It just turned into a drink my water, do my cardio, eat my breakfast. And it made it real easy whenever I wore the same thing to do cardio in. I mean, don't got to be pretty. Don't got to smell the bed. You know, I would just have, I would wear the same pants, same hoodie and go do cardio every day. You know, my pans and my, all my food would be kind of laid out the night before. I'd be ready to go. Next thing I know, I'm eating my breakfast, getting everything ready for getting my meals ready that are already prepared. Get my meals ready for the day. I got six, seven wins before I even leave the door to go to work. Perfect. Now, follow along here. This is the little math nerd in me. So, and if you recall in geometry class, you had to have like little proofs when you have to prove things, right? And the yeah. the scientific phrase is if P then Q. Yeah. If yeah. I brush my teeth and see my journal, then I will start my meditation piece. If P then Q. Yeah. Right. If I didn't do my meditation piece, means I probably didn't brush my teeth or I didn't see my journal. All right. Yeah. So if you want to set your environment up for a success and you make it obvious and you make it attractive, well, the opposites are absolutely true for habits you want to break. Here are some okay. examples. On the mindset piece, if I want to be a great at executing things, the last thing I want are distractions. Yep. It slows you down. I'll call it drag friction. So I'm always trying to eliminate drag. Biggest source of drag for me, if I have my phone nearby and it goes off for a text notification with all the posts we have to put out on social media, you might get a notification for this and that, emails, yeah. phone, right? So I set it up so only a phone call they'll come through, so I can answer that. And I set my set it up in my schedule so I'm only answering emails or calls during a certain time block. Otherwise, my phone might not even be in the same room with me because it's slowing down the fact that I want to execute better. If I get the pers- right. uh, the the distraction out of the room, I got a better shot. Nutrition wise, number of examples. No chips in the house, I do way better. Potato chips in the house enormous weakness for me. Yeah. When I'm working in the finance world, you're at a bank and some nice ladies are bringing in food for Fridays and they make these bagels or cookies for this or try this new dessert or the sales rep comes in they bring a whole bunch of bagels or Subway. You eat a lot of stuff, you gain weight quick. You're in a sedentary job and you're this sweet lady is bringing all this food or cookies and this and that. I understand it's the holidays, you might see more of it, but Normal Fridays are bringing that stuff in. I'll be eating it all the time, gain weight. What do I have to do then? Change my habit, my environment, so it wasn't obvious, it wasn't attractive. How do I not make it obvious? I wouldn't walk by that lady on those days on the way to the water cooler. How do I make it unattractive? When I would see that food, I would kind of whisper to myself as I'm walking by and kind of point a little bit, and I would just say, poison, poison, poison. For me now, I'm older. I know that if I eat much bread or pasta, I'm going to feel bloated. So if I order a burger, I might have half a bun or no bun. I'm, if I see that stuff, I love I love Italian food. I love pasta. I feel bloated. I'll just simply say bloated. It's not attractive then. I'm calling, I'm drawing a negative to that food. Right? Or you might point right. at that food and just say loser. I'm trying to win. You should just simply associate something negative so it's not attractive. And then avoid it. No. You got a problem with booze? Don't don't put it in your house. That's uh, it, it's funny that you bring that up because one thing that I do, especially in my lifestyle now, is 
I don't have a lot of, I don't keep a lot of food. The food that I do keep is, is usually all healthy food. So if I'm going to eat breakfast, it's always going to be eggs, blueberries, and oatmeal. So I only keep eggs, blueberry, and oatmeal. When it comes to my lunch, I eat beef and rice, vegetables, or maybe sweet potatoes. So quite literally, the only thing I keep around here, I don't keep snacks. I don't keep chips or stuff like that. I just keep beef, rice, uh, sweet potatoes, eggs, just the stuff that I know is healthy for me. And so when I get hungry and I get snackish, okay, well, I might as well just go eat a, a healthy meal so I don't start developing habits of eating uh, chips and, and cereal and stuff like that. So I just don't keep it. You're not going to get – you're not going to eat a bunch of bag, of bag of chips if you don't have it. Sure. So I just don't buy it. So, so I can just hear the listeners saying, well, yeah, well, that's Lucas. He lives by himself. It's different. And they're right. It is different. Yeah. So it takes you in the chapter nine, you know, your culture and your tribe, as Jesse Dale would say, or your teammates, one of our, one of our uh, team workers are one of our core values, right? So we imitate habits in different groups, close proximity, the masses, and then standing out. So those that are your close proximity, that's your family, right? Yeah. And if I'm trying to improve and spend some time meditating so I can be better at executing I'm going to tell Jen, my wife, hey, when I get up, this is what I'm doing. So don't bother yeah. me. So I'm going to get some yeah. buy-in. I get some support. Yeah. If I say, hey, if you're making pasta on Thursday, just let me know. I'll make something different. Just let me know. I'm not going to ask you to make more food. I'm going to make something different. Just let me know. Or I'll say this, you know, if you buy chips, give them to one of our kids because they love it. So there you go. Don't, just don't, I don't want to see it. Yeah. Sam can Sam plays so much soccer. He eats he can eat Oreos for all all his meals. Um, I would say keep that in your room. I don't want to see that stuff. So yeah. if I can get buy in from my team, I got right. a better shot. It's in creating the environment. I have to I have to communicate and ask for support. That's why when right. you go to a gym, if you're a CrossFitter and working out, working out with your entire team, it makes it easier. They're all swimming in the same direction. Right, they're paddling in the same direction. Yeah. So you have to go out and ask. And so it says right here, in the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate effectively have prevailed. That's straight from Darwin, right? The lone right. wolf dies, but the pack survives. So from anything done at home, Jen, well, Jen works from home. I work at the gym and I also work from home as well. We have to collaborate. This is what I'm trying to do. So right now while we're recording this, the heat's turned off because that way the furnace doesn't make any noise. Yeah. Right? The doors are shut. All the dogs are locked up so that if Amazon comes, no one knocks on the door and disturbs things. So yeah. you get by and you get to ask. And when they give you something, when they do something extra for you, someone on your, on your team, reward that behavior. Yeah. yeah. Simply saying thank you. Hey, you're making an impact. You're making me better. Thank you. I couldn't yeah. be here without you. Yeah. You you make yeah. a difference. Here's a free coffee, right? Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But if you get your family and friends on board, you got a better shot. And if you got those friends and you know who they are, right? Yeah. Hey Lucas, you going out tonight? <laughs> yeah, I know we got a game tomorrow, man, but it's not till late. We can go out tonight, yeah. right? All right. Absolutely. That's you know, all right. We'll be fine. If we get in by midnight, we can sleep till seven. We're good. Of course you're drunk at eleven thirty, so it, I got you. Ain't, dude, I got you. you ain't done at midnight. Right, you're already done, right? So it's got to be no, bro. Find a new friend. Yeah. Find new friends, right? At least find a new friend while you're trying to make a difference. You know, at least right. find a new group or a new friend while you are, you know, you are trying to stack habits. So you got a goal that you're working hard for. And you, you don't have to be stop being friends with them, but you can't let their bad habits influence your whole process because it, it, it only takes two or three times to step out of line. And all of a sudden that, that habit that you've been working so hard for falls underneath and you, you're not, you're not back on track. Like you were, you fall off and then you question why are you even doing it? Right. The so, thing about the habit, there's a, there's a momentum piece. Yeah. I did it one time. Good. Two times yeah. in a row. Good. Three then makes it a trend. Yeah. For a week in a row, 
right? You stop one day. Okay. I did seven out of eight. Good. Two days, seven out of nine. Three days, three misses. Now there's a new trend. You're tre- you were know, trending up, and now you're immediately trending down. Yeah. And those and trends the thing about and those that habits, is, they keep building. It is way easier to develop a bad habit than it is a good habit. Right. If you ask me, I think it is. Um, a little bit of extra sleep. Always, nobody ever complains about extra sleep. Right. You know, but you got cardio you got to do. You have meals you got to eat. You have to kind of prepare yourself for your work day. If you can't do any of that, you're just going to, you're going to fall behind. You're going to be a bad coach. You're going to be a bad mentor or a bad leader. You're going to lose your bodybuilding show, your Olympic lifting meet. So with all the habits that keep building one way or, yeah. or another, there's no stopping it, right? You're either moving up or you're, you're plateauing or, or you're moving down. That brings you right to the third law. First, you make it obvious then you make it attractive. The fishy sees the lure. It's obvious. You make it attractive. I kind of like that lure. Then you make it real easy. You put it right in front of its face, right? You put it right there. A good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. Best is the enemy of good, and taking action is always better than being in motion. Critical, get reps. Have the ha- You have to have the habit before you can improve it. So I can't improve my mindset piece on executing until I have the piece. I'm going to meditate, start building into my subconscious so that the first thing I do after I finish eating is I want to knock my first priority off. I do this two months in a row. I get up and I knock my first habit, uh, my first priority off. I could probably experiment with not doing the meditation. There's a lot of other reasons why I still should keep that one going. But I could experiment with not doing the meditation if I get up, go through the same routine, and still keep knocking my priorities off. Yeah. If my productivity stays at that same level or keeps continuing to improve and evolve, then what I'm doing right now has gotten me to this point. I'm going to need to find the next step to evolve to the next point. So can I make it easy? Yep. I'm, everything's right there. The app is right there for my nutrition. My supplements are right there. My creatine's right there. My journal's right there. It's so easy. I'd be silly to miss it because it's right there in front of me. I have one of my nutrition clients. I have him weigh in every day so we know what the data is. It's right in front of his toilet. At least that's what he's told me. I've told him to do. So you get up and go to the bathroom. It's there. You're going to trip on it. There's no reason not to know what you weigh every day, right? So making i want to ha- i want to make it so i can find out what moves the needle the most with the least amount of effort the habit that is realized is one of the, is the one that delivers the most value with the least effort habits get us what we want so next what moves the needle for me if i have my journal right and i'm done i already want to have it written out from the day before when i close bit my business day here are my tasks for the next day. Here's number one. Here's a priority. Right? So my number one priority today, I had another call at noon. I want to make sure that when I was, I got up, did my routine, went right to the gym, knocked that out, got this next task done. I, pre- I prepped for everything from my, my noon meeting. It was done. For nu- nutrition, the next big needle mover, well, what's the first thing that goes in? That's going to be breakfast. Like you said, I eat these X number of things. So things that are in my st- stable of breakfast foods, either a shake for anywhere from four to 600 calories, 50 grams of protein, or it might be two or three eggs or a bunch of egg whites, cottage cheese, or yogurt. So I get up to 50, 50 grams of protein, any kind of carbs I want, basically all the fruit I want, all the fruit I, I can I can handle. So there's usually fruit in my shakes, or if I'm having whole foods, I'll have a bunch of fruit there bunch of water and then I'm I'm on my way. So if I can have my supplements, take my creatine, and I already knock out breakfast, well I'm probably 25, 30% of the way done for the day. Next would be my snack, right? Yeah. Or lunch. What's something that you make it so it's super easy at the gym and that it makes a big impact? Let's say it's a max out day. Yeah. 
All right. What's something you guys do that make it easy for everyone to perform well on that day? If we're going to do any kind of testing or anything that's strenuous, we're going to probably prep for it. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to back squat, a heavy back squat, we're going to prep the lower body for back squat. So our kids know that when we are going to go for a heavy lift or we got big movements coming up, we're probably going to prep those muscles for those movements. And we're going to spend a lot of time in those, those areas to prime the, the body for what we're about to do that day. So everybody so does the same, huh? So foam rollers might already be out. So I see yeah. that so they can yeah. start massaging their, their legs out, yeah. right? Yeah. Bands might be and out so they can get their backs activated and things like that. So yeah. you put the equipment out or bars are already on the rack. Yeah. And may, maybe you're only playing, like I'm playing Kid Rock, Baba Daba. Yeah. And they walk in because they know, hey, it's squat day, right? And yeah. it's uh, it's max out day. So it's obvious. It's easy. Um, it's yeah. attractive. Things are already out. And boom, all right, start prepping. Get your mind right. And usually if we're, we're, we're leading up to a test or leading up to some, I'm communicating with them well in advance. I expect – I'm talking a whole month out, a whole block away. Mm -hmm. Hey, expect in the next four weeks that – Volume is going to be going down. Weight's going to be going up. What we're working for and what we're working towards. So, getting them mentally and um, mentally focused and on the right mindset to prepare for that next four weeks, so what they know what to expect. So that's, that's just. Our a, a, it's already obvious to them in advance, yeah. not just that day. Yeah, and we we try to do a good job of giving them all the information they need to know, and then it's execution from there. Gotcha. And the prep for those those certain days, and uh, you know, it's making sure the kids are before they say we're back squatting, making sure our kids are practicing good depth on their warm up sets, emphasizing you know these good habits there. Um, Making sure everybody, when we do our warm up, everybody does the same thing. We're doing the, the, the proper exercises, keeping everybody on the same task. Mm -hmm. Try to end our warm up same time every day so we can get the right amount of time because we're, we're, we don't have a lot of time to actually lift. So we try to be efficient as we possibly can with our warm ups, with our prep work so that we can roll right into that and keeping them ahead of the game with, with information. Um, Allows them to prepare for that better. Sure. Essentially execute better. So back to that ability to execute and perform what you're trying to do, trying to win, win the day. Yeah. If you have a hard day coming up, and by hard, there's a lot of there's a lot of activities that's going on. So you might have multiple yeah. meetings. If you're a student athlete, you're gonna have classes, you're gonna have homework, you might have tests. Yeah. Right. You might have to do some volunteer work. You might have something at home. You might have to mow the yard. You might have to do some work, right? So you have yeah. a lot of things already causing you friction before you can do the main things you want to do to help you advance as an athlete. Right. Okay, I get that. You might have spouse. You might have kids, whatever. It still means it still doesn't provide an excuse, hey, I can't get this done. You still need to get this task done if you want to evolve, improve, and win. Yeah. So then it becomes more and more critical that you reduce the friction and drag as much as possible. Example, so if I've got three meetings today with people that are trying out the gym or say I'm going to Kiwanis and i got three meetings, so I'm doing a networking event plus those three meetings, that's four. Well, there's going to be some time to prep in advance for those meetings. If I have to do all of that today, well, then I'm basically out of time. Yeah. If when I finish Friday afternoons and I don't have much going on, and I do all the prep for all my meetings the fo the following week. I have all my notes. I keep it in one folder for weekly meetings. All week long, I carry that around. So all my meetings I'm already prepared, or prepared for. I don't have to prepare that day. Because I know that Monday and Tuesday, literally this week, are busier for me. If I want to get other things done, I need to prepare this stuff in advance to get that stuff out of the way 
so I can still make sure I get to the gym, make sure I'm doing all these things I want I want to do. Right. So if I'm trying to execute better at running this business, I have to get the drag out of the way, which I did Saturday and Sunday, so that I can perform today. If you're an athlete, yeah. you get your homework done at night or on the weekends in advance. You read ahead in advance so that during the big day when you get to get all the stuff done, you can still get the priorities done. You know, you aren't afforded the luxury of an excuse. Well, I was busy. I didn't have time to do this. No, that's a lie to yourself. That's bullshit. Quit lying to yourself. You move things around. You prioritize and execute. Yeah. So you can still still get things done. Yeah. I like to, I got a, a, a quote that I like. Um, Winners find solutions and losers find excuses. For sure. Right. It's pretty obvious. There's right. always an excuse. I can give you an excuse for anything right now. In fact, yeah. this is the second recording I did today. I'm already tired. It's it's after 7 o'clock. But you know what? Yeah. The thing is, I'm trying to win a certain thing, and I le- legit like this. Yeah. So other things yeah. that are fun, things that I like, I have to lose those so I can yeah. do the things, this, that I love. You have to take what you love and have it win, and things that you like, they don't get to win anymore because you only have so much time. With procrastinating... Any new habit, this is brand new. So I'm trying to do the meditation. That's why I said it has to be two minutes. Because you can do anything for two minutes. I could train you to right. I could train you to hold your breath for two minutes. Yeah. So yeah. meditate for two minutes. All right, I can do that. No one's gonna sit there and say, I don't have two minutes. No one's gonna say, Well, I free, I don't have time to get my stuff together and take all my supplements. You have two minutes. Here's what you can do. So if you're starting a new habit, right out of the book, chapter chapter uh thirteen. Any new habit takes two minutes, and you make it easy. And after that, you get used to that. You evolve. Then you make it just easy. Then you make it moderate. Then you make it hard. Then you make it very hard because you yeah. keep wanting to evolve and move the needle. If you're already used to hard, and you make it just a little bit harder, well, just a little bit harder is actually easy. This is what's marginal. This is what's the different pieces. You're used to this. You're used to lifting four days a week. If I'm doing four days a week plus 10 minutes of accessories, well, that's just four days a week plus this. This is the new habit. That's what's hard. So you take what you're used to and you evolve it just a little bit. That's the new habit. That's the two-minute approach. That's how you make the next evolution. That's how you get better. Yeah. People come in. Man, I want to make sure I'm lifting five days a week. I want to track my food. I want to do CrossFit immediately. I want to, I want to hire you guys for nutrition as well. And then you do that mindset stuff. Yeah, let's do that too. And I'm like, hold on, pal. I throw so much at you. You're going to be so overwhelmed. That is not right. easy. That is not obvious. That is not attractive. It will yeah. not be satisfying. Those are the four textbook things we're going to break. This will all fall apart immediately. You won't last 60 days. You probably last two weeks underneath that yeah. complete shift. Right. Unless you sign up and you go to boot camp where you're locked in there and you can't get out, you're under controlled, you're controlled like that. You can't just take that on mentally. It's too overwhelming. You take what you're used to and just evolve it a little bit. Especially when you got the freedom to choose whether you want to do something or not. Right. Just kind of adds a more difficult component to that because if you're in a structured environment where you don't have a choice but to adapt. You're going to you're going you're going to adapt, right? <laughs> but if you if no if if it's up to you and you already aren't somebody that is a driven focused person, sure. You're not just going to like I said earlier, you're not just going to flip the switch and all of a sudden be getting up at, in the morning, getting your breakfast in, drinking your water and tracking all your stuff down. It's just not going to happen. So you need to set it up so there's forces pushing you in that habit to make it happen. So you tell your friends and family. You you make a public post on Facebook. You write yeah. out a contract and share it with someone and state this. And if you do this, so you have and you list out all your whys, right? So if you can get enough yeah. forces pushing you in a direction, well now it's a lot easier. You have all the stuff pushing you. You have momentum. You're just yeah. going down the river because it's pushing you that way. You start swimming up river, well shoot man, you can't win. Set yeah. uh, set yourself up. So once you do these three things, make it obvious, make it easy, make it attractive, right? That 
The fish sees it. It's obvious. Here's the lure. It's attractive. I like that little lure. All right, here's a little worm yep. on the hook. It's easy. It's right in front of it. And then it's satisfying to that fish because it knows if I eat this protein, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to live a little bit longer. Yeah. So then they, they jump on that hook, and I'm really, really happy, right? Yeah. yeah. So the fourth law, make it satisfying. You have to enjoy what just occurred on some small scale. That's why enjoyment has to be a core yeah. value. You have to enjoy it on some kind of scale. So you do it again. And the point is to do it again and do it again. So when you see that gold star on our app for improving something, that's a mental win. That's that dopamine boom. For uh, for me, I'm all about this little tick mark. Yeah. I'll talk about you know with naming the book inches or something along the line of inches. I talk about a building block for any of those six things that we try to build. So one day gets you a tick mark, and another one is the bottom of the box, and the next one is the next uptick, and then I can close that box. Here's a squat. There's four days in a row. Then I make it with a few more days. I can make it a three dimensional box. After a week, I can work on my second box. How big can I get my boxes, right? So I keep building this. Boom. Like if I get, if I log my food like a week in a row on the app, there's like these little fireworks that explode and there's a, some stars yeah. and it's like you get a little cheer, right? Yeah. There's that dopamine effect. Hey, yay. Like fans are cheering. So yeah. just that, keeping track of yourself, you're alone. There's going to be some dopamine effect there. You tell your friends that have helped you, hey, you know what? I lost three pounds this week. You helped yeah. me do this. Thank you. So they're going to be happy for you. And then you just rewarded them. You made it satisfying to them for helping you. Yeah. You go and thank your coach. You reward that person for helping you get better. They're going to try even more to help you. So if you make it satisfying, all the prior laws, the three laws, they focus on the past. This fourth one focuses on the future. The rewards are repeated. You want to, you will avoid punishments. You give your incentives, your incentives to push that behavior forward, but also you're avoiding the pain that comes from not performing. And then it leads you, leads you right in the 16. How do you stick to it? Number one, track it. Yep. We improve what we measure. You measure your back squat. You measure your time in the 40. You measure how many tackles you had. You, med, you, you measure how many goals you prevented. You measured your time running running the mile. If you track, these are things that are important. Every business has them. They, they're key performance indicators. Net income leads to stock pair, stock prices gains, right? Yeah. Number of people working improves the economic numbers. So track what's important. Automate as much as possible immediately. And then you want to set up these stop gaps. If you talk to my wife, Jen, she'll say, never miss Monday. If you're training, never miss Monday. On the nutrition piece, people say, well, I had a cheat day. No. Give yourself a cheat meal, not an entire 24 hours. You can have such a bad food hangover from 24 hours, you just wreck your nutrition. So if nutrition is one of the things I'm focusing on today, a stop gap is one cheat meal at a time. Must go three days without a cheat meal. Don't miss Mondays training wise. Never miss two days in a row. Because you get the two days, maybe something really does happen and some kids are sick and you can't get there. Now you miss three. Three is the definition of a trend. And you are setting your habits. So you have to set up these stop gaps. What my dad would do, he would put his shoes right by the door, the tennis shoes. So if he saw his tennis shoes, he would get his gym bag set and then go to the gym. So your stopgap might be always have my gym bag ready. Yeah. If you have these other rules in place that you don't break, those are already habits that you believe and have. They're part of your identity. So you'll see, Jen, like don't miss Mondays or don't miss two days in a row because we'll be saying it. That's another this small little thing that keeps moving you forward. You guys have anything like that that kind of makes, hey, whatever you do, don't do this. That, do we have anything like that? Yeah. Uh, um, the things we have at the gym, whatever you do, if you're bailing when you're squatting, don't bail it onto the person that's spotting you. Oh, yeah. Um, right. Right. We, uh, 
when, for example, for back squatting, we always raise our, our catches for just in case a kid bails. Um, I kind of have this rule, no, no failing, but if you do make sure you got the catches high enough, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's really just common sense to keep an athlete safe. Sure. But that's what, squatting, a, that's what a stop gap is. It prevents pain. It prevents a loss. A stop gap on by, on owning a stock means if it gets below a certain price, you get out of it. Right. You're you're and it's, you're plugging the hole in the dam. So I know that. Hey, all right, fine. We bought one bag of chips. Well, God, whatever you do, don't buy two. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean. When I talk to our athletes, say a kid misses with our in-season teams right now, we only have two days a week that they're actually scheduled out to actually train in the weight room. Mm -hmm. I'll tell them, if you miss Monday, you better not miss Friday. That's our, that's our boys basketball schedule, Monday and Friday. If you miss Monday, you better not miss Friday. Cause if you miss Friday, you, you're, you're zero percent on your week for your for your training. You got zero percent better physically. We're at the point in the in the season. Our season's about to start. If you weren't in the weight room for the last eight nine months, you're already behind. And if you're gonna miss Monday, you better not miss Friday. And I tell you, take advantage of all your opportunities. Because you're not always going to have these opportunities. They go away pretty quick. And if you just keep missing them, or you don't care, or it's not a priority, and you don't get the results that you expect or that you think you're going to get, you're not going to be able to end your career and go, I did everything I could to do better, to get better. I did everything I could to be the best athlete, to be the best teammate. And you won't have any regrets, regardless if you win a state championship or you get knocked out second round sectionals. You gave your very, very best. So that, those things are just designed to keep you safe. So back to the examples of mindset and being better at executing. One of my stop gaps is I always wanted to hit that first one in the morning, right? Yeah. Here are my top five targets for the day. Well, no matter what I'm hitting these, I always hit three. Yeah. I want to hit five. A stretch goal might be eight. Here's my here's my next twenty. I'm sure they're already lit, you know, written out, but I know I'm not getting yeah. that done. I want to make sure I get three. If yeah. I get three, I can call my day. You know, I execute well. All right, I'm good. The way they lay that lay, they lay it out in the book here. James Clear lays it out in the book. Maybe you feel like crap. Maybe you don't want to get to the gym. Obviously, you want to be there, be intentional, have high intensity, get better results. Right. On the flip side, you could just not show up at all and take a zero. Yeah. Well, if you're working out three days a week on 52 weeks, that's 156 sessions. What if 10 of those times, let's say 15 of those times, 10% of those times, 15 of those times, you don't feel like going, something's going wrong, you just don't have it that day, and you take 15 zeros. What if you come in all 15 of those, day, of those days and you just check a box, you do the minimum, you get the basics of the stimulus, not the whole full effects of it, you get a 50%. 15 times 50% is 7.5. That's 7.5 days. That's half of it, right? Oh, yeah. I'm a whole, three days a week, I'm over two weeks already ahead of you, the person that took those zeros. Right? So if I can... Take a stop gap. All right, I'm going to show up. I'm going to get the minimum done and just move. Source can be from from playing and performing. All right, I'm good. At least I'm not taking yeah. a zero. It's yeah. another huge stop gap they, they talk about there. And it's a good way to at least people keep their trend going so they're moving in the right direction. It's mm -hmm. not going to be perfect, but you're still getting the compound interest effect. Right. Without taking a zero, which is, is a setback. Yeah, it's especially whenever, you know, when you're in a classroom setting, we talk about this to a lot of kids. Um, 
so you got five days of classwork, right? Well, the way we grade, you get your dress and you get your participation. There's only two points you, you earn. If you don't dress, you won't get your participation. You have to at least dress. You have to at least dress. And if you, if you give 50% effort, I mean, you probably get your points, but are you going to get better? You know? So when we get guy, guys and, and kids that come in and, and they don't work out, they don't dress, they can't participate, they got to do something else, you know, they essentially get a zero. If you get two zeros in a week, you're sitting at a C minus. And we lay it out that way. Say, hey, you missed two days. You didn't dress for two days and you and you think it's okay. Well, it's not okay. Look, this is the grade that you're going to get. So it's it's pretty easy from a grading aspect and a show it to your face. This is what you're going to get for, you so know, the, not so so just two zeros already knocks you down to a C minus. Yeah. Whereas you do the minimums, they get to do a little bit better, right? Yeah. You're already well above that. Right. If you're used to D's and F's, a C minus is looking good. If you're used to C minuses, well, now, now we're talking, we're in the B range. Right. Now we, we still have the habit. Now I can't improve it. Yeah. From a nutrition standpoint, that was the other example I'm running through today. My stop gap's going to be logging my food. I never, you know, make sure you don't miss. And then the next priority is going to be, all right, did I hit my protein number? Maybe I was over or under my calories. Maybe I was over or, over, over or under my carbs or my fat, whatever. Stop gap. All right, I, I hit my protein I hit my protein number. I tracked everything so I know what went in so I can still improve the habit because I know what it is. I have the data for it because I'm tracking it. And I hit my stop gap. I hit my protein number. Bam. Okay, fine. So if I can hit these things, those stop gaps now become the minimum standard. You want to evolve further? Just raise your standard. My next stop gap will be, all right, well, the minimum is I'm going to track my food, I'm taking my supplements, and I'm hitting my protein number. Boom. Three things, raise my standard. And the minimum standard for, just start talking like a high school athlete, minimum standard is probably better than a lot of other. A lot of other folks, right? Regular, it's, it's probably, you're probably beating other athletes. Doesn't mean you're going to beat the best athletes, but you're probably doing more than some if you just meet a minimum standard every day. And it takes you back to the you have your outcomes, which then designs your process, your process, which then builds your identity. Where your identity becomes that that standard that you're at right now. As your identity gets stronger with what you're trying to become, and then moves your habits again which then leads to more of the outcomes and the processes. So as you're becoming this person whose identity is, you know, I'm an achiever. I'm a D1 athlete. I'm a pro athlete. I'm playing soccer at IU. I'm playing baseball at Vanderbilt. I'm playing football at Georgia, right? I'm this. Right. I'm a Marine, right? People say these, right? This is who they are. And you're at that standard with everyone else, then you decide do you want to evolve past the herd. You simply just keep raising that bar in those areas. Your standard becomes there, and then you then you win. The next piece is probably my favorite. And it talks about bringing on an accountability ally. And when you do that, there should be some kind of contract involved. You state it publicly. It doesn't necessarily need to be a legal binding contract, but should be someone local. There should be tangible, concrete, severe, and immediate consequences. So when people will come to me and they'll say, hey, I'm ready to do X. It's usually not coming to me because after they've known, known me for a while, it's not because they're trying to do something smaller. When they evolve past the, I'd like to do this or it'd be cool if I do this. It's like, no, I have to or I must do this or I then I'm, I'm going to get called in as their ally or coach. And it's such a huge honor and compliment when someone asks that. 
or if you ask someone else, and will you be my ally in this, which requires you to be more detached and logical with what I'm with what my actions are. Yeah. So you keep me on task and accountable and moving forward. Yeah. I'm asking you to partner with me and say, hey Jim, that is not okay. I am asking you to care enough and give a shit enough to say that is not okay. Based on what you are trying to become, these actions are not okay. These other actions are. And that if you're asked or you're in that role, you're really tasked with not giving up on them, not quitting. So as long as they're moving forward, you're tasked to keep them on, on target. So when someone says, hey, Jim, you know, I, I didn't log my food. I know I said I would, and they're kind of casual about it. I'm like, that's interesting. You told me you want to do all these things, and you didn't log your food. And you, more you're just kind of flippant and casual about it. That whole thing is not okay. And yeah. if you want me to continue to work with you, we're going to agree that it's not okay. And the way we're, I'm going to believe that you agree that that's not okay is you're going to drag this sled for a full mile, which will probably take you about an hour. And it'll be like... Yeah. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? I go. What do you think? <laughs> right now, when yeah. they hit their wins, I'm like, huge praise. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Let's go. I'm all in. You're playing. I'm coming to watch. Right. But when you mess up, now you mess up occasionally. One out of a hundred. Okay, fine. Yeah. No one's perfect. Right. You have two in the same week. That is not okay. Yeah. That is not okay. That is not okay. So can you find an ally that's going to push you? You have a huge shot of changing your habits and, and evolving and, and improving. Because now your locked arms going to battle. All right. If you guys have the same goals of what you guys want to become, you guys both play on offense, and you're trying to win a state title in soccer, can you guys push each other, right? Yeah. If you find an ally – with the same or similar goals and aspirations and pro processes deadly deadly well, that's why that's why you see that's what makes a successful team successful you know it's not a team full of individuals trying to do their own thing like you said earlier the lone wolf dies the pack survives that that directly correlates to every team sport there is and as a coach, you know, I think this is how it is for – should be or at least should – every coach should be somewhat of an ally to all of anybody that you're coaching, especially – That's part of the job know, in, description, right? Yeah, in the, in you can't the high be their buddy, buddy, and hey, that's okay. Oh, you missed, you missed practice. Right. That's okay. that, that is bullshit. That is not okay. Right. As a and coach, at the high you, school, uh, that's, that's a minimum standard. Right. And, and that's the, the thing that – I harp on uh, quite a bit is whenever you're a coach say at the high school level and you're in the school, I think it's important that coaches are in the schools and around the kids that they coach so that they can hold them accountable and keep them to task, focused, right? keep them on task, keep the standard, even when they're not at practice or they're at weight training or whatever it is, they're just walking through the hall and they're not meeting the standard and they're, just not meeting that standard, you got a chance to fix that right then and there. And that's why as a coach, if I'm, if I got kids that are coming in, I'm not going to be a jerk. Obviously I want to be somebody that they can come in and train around and, and love to be around and, and, and work, but they need to understand that there's a certain standard that we need to operate and, when I when I have to enforce a standard, it's not because I'm I don't I dislike you. It's because I'm trying to hold you accountable and hold you to a certain standard so that you can be successful in your sport and out of your sport. Because at one point, everybody's going to be done with sports. Everybody's going to be done playing, and you're probably going to have a boss, and you're probably going to ha have a job, and you're have you're going to have to do this this thing called work, and you're probably going to have to maintain a certain standard. You want to prep these kids for that. All this so. translates to everything beyond the field, 
everything beyond the core. All of this yeah. translates to every bit of life going forward. What I like here at the end, he lists, uh, James Clear lists in his advanced tactics a few things. The first one is, is in my opinion, critical, and I'm kind of on an island about this and dealing with a lot of folks. Winner, winners are best at the boring and mundane, but the powerful habits, right? So the main lifts, the big sec are the most, you get the most bang for the buck, right? Yeah. And you'll see that right in Robert Greene's book on mastery, the true masters. They even mentioned in CrossFit about virtuosity. You're just great at the basics, just better than everybody else. You're great at doing the things that it's called the fundamentals for a reason. All the flashy stuff, that's cute and all. Right, but really, what moves the needle the most are the things that are boring and mundane. Two, pick habits that are just slightly out of reach, not miles away. So wherever your level of competency and workloads are, make the next habit just beyond that. If it's so far beyond, you're just going to feel feel unattainable, and it's defeating. It's not obvious. It's not attractive. It's not satisfying. It's not easy. So then, it's not it's not really sustainable. Yeah, we must also then seek to solve bigger problems. So if you pick those habits that are just slightly out of reach, and you start reaching those, well, then the habit is to continue to evolve and seek bigger problems, solve bigger problems, find other solutions. So in this process of me being better and better at executing, well, here's the basics of how I'm getting to here to this level. Yeah, making sure I'm getting those three tasks tasks done. How do I evolve so that I'm always getting four, right? That has to be it. And then yeah. five, right? The next piece, identity. Those habits, your identity habits are the hardest to break. So if someone says, hey, I'm a runner, I have always run. I'm yeah. a runner. They say, I am this. They believe it. They feel yeah. it. Well, they'll continue to do train, but they'll also do the running. If someone says, hey, I've always, I've always trained, right? Okay, well, those days that when it's zero degrees outside or 100 degrees outside, we still have a consistent group of people that are all, they'll always go to the gym. Yeah. Right? It becomes of who they are. Like Jeremy Johnson at the gym, he's almost there as consistently as the equipment itself. It's like a piece of <laughs> furniture, right? Yeah. This is, this is what I do. This is yeah. what I do. I shave my head and I go to the gym, right? And yeah. I push, right? Yeah. So uh shows up. And I asked him, how you doing? He goes, never better. And this is what, so this is the part, when, it's, when you can ingrain these things and become part of your identity, deadly. Yeah. So what I do here to kind of wrap things up, I, I take these laws and these practices and I dissect an athlete and I'll look at their mindset and their knowledge and their ability to deal with teammates. And I'm going to say, all right, I need to move the needle a little bit from where we're at on all three of these things, and I use these same approaches in all three. And then their training and their nutrition and their recovery, same thing. And then can I, as the coach, identify the bigger movers, right? If I get them to do these six things every day, I got I got them winning. They're winning the day. They're building their confidence, and they're yeah. getting better. They're evolving, right? I can get them, build it in their identity. Now it's like, hey, I'm a champion. I'm a winner. I do this. Yeah. I'm first to the line in sprints. Everyone else is complaining. I'm like, weather's well, great out here. They learn to be relentless. They learn to keep pushing through discomfort. And things that are discom that are un uncomfortable for others don't bother them because they're used to the workload. That becomes normal to them. If I get them to do this, Mentally and physically, they are better and they're more capable and they got a better shot at winning. And that's exactly what they're going to do. Right. That that kind of makes me think about my first six months when I first got this, this job. Um, there was never a, a set standard of operations before I, I, I took over over here. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, I've got to set a certain standard. Right. And in my head, I was thinking, OK, I need to set the standard here. And I really, really found out real quick that I'm never going to get him here. So what I have to do is I got to set the standard here and bump them up as a right. coach myself every day, day to day, 
They may not do be perfect movers. They may not be the best lifters. They may not love it. They may not like it. But as a job, my as my job as a coach, my I have to elevate them just a little bit. And once we get to the standard, it may take four weeks, may take eight weeks. I bump it up just a little bit. So essentially, I meet them where they're at, and I help them as a coach elevate their standard every day by coaching, keeping the, a a consistent structure, a consistent level of of standard that they can reach and once they reach it i just bump it up a little bit so just a little bit more right just, just crank a little bit more when you first started how many people would show up to the uh, training sessions in the weight room before or after like to the class or the after school stuff either way what's, um, the, before and, what's the before and after like early on after school I first get, you show up how I many be there i had First couple weeks, I had maybe ten football players show up after school. How many are on the How many are on the team? Sixty. Okay. Every, and then every we start with sixty. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so where are we at now? Yeah, we got. I mean, I have anywhere between seventy and eighty-five kids come through between our two lift groups after school. Depends so, on the season as well. So there's more football players playing, and of those that are playing, more and more are actually in the gym. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not it's in the class, whether or not it's after school, right? More athletes. I wouldn't even just say football, but just more athletes in general are in the class now. We only had when I first basketball, got there. We had vo- basketball, volleyball. Didn't matter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, more we now, just started more and more and more. We had 25 wrestlers show up first day of weight training for wrestling. And this is our the first year that wrestling hopped on the the, the weight room, and we had twenty five show up. So, so th- this year in twenty three, you had twenty five. For last a program, year had zero. last year had zero. Yeah, Went. that's uh, what we're talking about. And it's you know, when I first got there, we had seven we had seven classes that would come into the weight room. Two classes of them were actual athletes, so we only had two athlete classes, and we only had fifty athletes in the weight. In the weight room. Mm. Uh, last year we had 145. This year our numbers are a little bit lower. Um, and so, you know, but from year to year we continue to get more athletes in the weight room after school in the or class in the, or in the classroom between the two of them. Yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. That's impact, and that's what you and I are trying to do here, and that's what we're that that's basically our our objective. That kind of brings us to the end. So, there it is. Atomic Habits. Looks, yep, there you go. has his own. So, I use it all the time. I have not been through this book. I know a lot of these principles I'm already using, but I went through it again just to prepare for today. And I'm like, oh, man, why did I forget? How did I forget this? Why don't I remind yeah. myself about this? I'm talking to Jen. I'm like, oh, shoot. So, this is one of those ones where, you know, I got pages written in every other one. This dog-eared everywhere. I have it all outlined in a notebook on one note. So this is something I use all the time. The more I do, the better I do. So give it a shot. You should try to evolve it in all six of those areas like I'm talking about. And it moving the needles a little bit, raising your your, your standards, your elevations. That's that's the goal. So get the book. It's worth it's worth it and use it. Don't just read it and say, Hey, that's nice. It's a great cup holder. No, use it and uh you'll have better and better success. So thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next time.